You're listening to the Biohackers World Podcast. Hi, I'm Shiana Rivers. I'm Cash. And we are filming live at Biohackers World. So, Cash. Good to see you. Thanks for being here today. Pleasure. Uh, You often speak about how our genetic blueprint can explain why we feel, think, and respond the way we do. As someone who guides people through human design and somatic signals, do you think there's a place for intuitive or energetic self-knowing in how we interpret our DNA? Oh yeah, so um, the genetics of the mind, it's really cool how if I had your DNA, I could describe your sense of belief, your personality, your propensities towards trauma. All of how we perceive the world is driven by the neurochemicals in our brain and how we produce, bind and clear these neurochemicals, the, the lens we see through, is determined by the genes we have. So as a simple example, there's simple genes around when you go through a moment of impact, stimulus. Are you remembering the information or are you remembering the feeling? A gene will determine that. For some two people trying to talk to each other now about what happened, completely different perspectives. So yeah, in terms of recall, you know, your perspective, perception, it's all driven by the genes that drive the neurochemicals. Gotcha. Uh, so your journey of reversing five chronic conditions after learning about your genetic sensitivities really echoes how many of us in the healing space have had to become our own case studies. Mm-hmm. Do you think we're moving toward a future where everyone becomes their own healer through their genetic self-knowledge? So the tools all exist sort of fragmented, and now you're starting to see this, you know, platforms and things putting things together. And what you're gonna see is a shift from the hierarchy of here's all the clinician and scientists and I'm at the bottom, to I go back up to the top. And the data is the, the conduit to those professionals, right? What was missing before was our access to the data. And what data? What matters? Is it res- d- disease-centric, responsive data? Or is it day-to-day measurement? You are responding now to prevention as opposed to pain, right? So now that the tools exist, you're seeing like Heads Up Health is here. They're allowing a platform to put it all together where you can track everything. You're gonna see more and more of that. And essentially the patient's gonna come back to the middle and everybody else is outside of the bubble. So I feel personally like all of that shifted uh, tremendously during COVID. Um, because people were like, mm, I guess we can't trust yeah. these other ones, so we kind of need to learn for ourselves. Yeah. Um, how do you see it progressing since COVID until the future, especially with the now uh, connections with AI getting involved with this kind of work? So, you know, the, the need for AI isn't as profound as people think because the patterns already exist. The, so in, in its infinite complexity of the human body, what we need to do is actually quite simple, right? And so in that simplicity, whether it's mold, EMF, toxins of some sort that you're inhaling, eating, creating even, um, it's not an infinite amount of information. And so you now see great functional medicine, medicine doctors that see a pattern and know exactly what to do, right? So the AI may solve problems like rare genetic conditions, a needle in a haystack, some unique switch that needs to be turned on or off that nobody could find, great. That's a tiny fraction of our problems. The vast majority is caused, it's chronic, it's what we breathe, what we eat, our relationships. And I see that we already see the patterns emerging. Um, And I I would see AI more assists the primary still the functional medicine practitioner who has the experience. So your work emphasizes how stress response and detox genes affect our long-term health. From a somatic lens, I see how stored stress in the body impacts everything. Have you seen correlations between genomic stress profiles and how people carry stress in their bodies? Yeah, so anyone I work with, whether it's an NBA basketball player, whether it's a celebrity, whether it's stay-at-home mom or dad, it doesn't matter who, we always start with nervous system. And it doesn't even matter what their problem is. Whether it's just like, I'm a biohacker, I wanna live forever, or like I have stage four cancer, it doesn't matter. We always start with nervous system. Because until that's regulated, nothing else works, right? And so we're able to use genes to determine how people perceive. So some people have a deep visceral expression of anxiety. They're wired for it. Some people ignore it, but both are problems. One is you're overwhelming. One is you're burning out because you're taking on too much because you can't even perceive it, right? right? Either way, you're hurting yourself. Right. So what's changed is the context, the amount of stimulus, the amount we're supposed to process, the culture of what we think product- productivity actually looks like, the percentage of rest and recovery versus you know, action. Human biology is designed to be in high stress 5% of the waking day. 
that's what it can tolerate. We live the opposite, right? So everybody has to resolve this. It's a cultural thing. The way we resolve it, we use genetics to be sort of bio-individual. And do you think it's a cultural thing just in America or worldwide? So it's a very American problem. Uh, but I would say that doesn't mean the rest of the world is in the safe zone. But there are many places where this isn't true. And this is where, if you, if you look at places like the, the Blue Zones, like Dan Butner's work, right? Look at what they do to experience living to 120, which is what they do. It's not a bunch of biohacks. And I'm not saying the biohacks are wrong. I'm saying the biohacks should be about extension, not getting to what we're already capable of doing. A big part of why they live so long is like in Japan, ikigai, sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. They just never let go of their purpose. Mm -hmm. They don't retire, they don't stop, right? In, you know, in Italy, it's quality of relationships. They don't eat a meal with all their friends and family around them, right? right? Uh, so these basic sort of foundational habits, yes, American culture creates disease, right? I, uh, I pointed out to some friends yesterday that I felt like, you know, these kinds of conferences often attract more Europeans and yeah. other cultures versus Americans. How do you think we can shift that as we progress with this kind of work? So the shift is there. It's just taking, so the desire, the curiosity, it's all there, right? Um, when someone hears a word like biohacking, like, ah, I'm not gonna do that, right? And so that transition of how do you go to sort of like that person that's pre, they're not really there yet, and that's happening everywhere. You, you can't talk to a person who hasn't been to a cold plunge. You can't talk to a person who hasn't been to a sauna recently, right? Uh, everyone's exploring their supplementation. Everyone knows what a peptide is now. Take it back even three years ago, that wasn't true. Right. Now what is the next three years gonna look like? Right. right? So it may not be under the umbrella of this biohacking world we're in, but the tools are all gonna get out there, mm -hmm. right? I agree. So just like you mentioned, there's a, a lot of buzz around biohacking, um, specifically for longevity, but not enough talk about emotions, trauma, or nervous system dysregulation might be the reason people can't stick to protocols. So do you think genomics can offer insight on, into someone's emotional resilience or capacity for change? Yeah, I think it's priorities, right? So when someone's trying to regulate their nerves, most people will fail. And like, this didn't work, I feel worse. It's a, because the reason you got there may not be the same reason of the person that provided you a solution. It, wor it worked for them, but like you said, healers are who are, who are here providing, you know, because they heal themselves, they want everyone to know. Mm -hmm. But they healed themselves. Doesn't mean it'll work for you. Right. There's a whole list of tools you can use. Now, the bio-individual need is what got me there. The state looks the same, it feels the same, but my path to getting there was different. Right. For some people it is their dopamine levels and seeking reward. For some people it's their adrenaline and holding on to trauma. For some people it's a neurochemical called brain-drive neurotropic factor and giving things too much meaning and too much weight. For some people it has to do with serotonin and irritability and frustration. So the path is different. So if you solve the wrong problem, you don't solve the problem, right? So yes, there's gonna be a layer of, um, genetics informing my actual problem, and then prioritizing of all the tools I could use, what's the right solution, right? I agree, and I think of all those, uh, some of those emotions and stuff that you listed, I feel like irritability is, is yeah. a big one with it, especially when I see you know, these people with their, their road rage, yeah. you know? and it's like, how do you get out of, out of that or even help somebody out of that kind of yep. emotional state? Yeah, and people are, they don't realize they're living in fight or flight. Mm -hmm. They don't live, realize that they're living in nervous system dysregulation because again, culturally it supports that that's the way you're supposed to feel. Mm -hmm. As opposed to rest and recovery is foundation and then the acute stress is once in a while. It's supposed right. to be turned on when needed, right. not your baseline, right? right? For our sur survival, yeah. you know, for our not necessarily uh, fruits and berries hunting yes. anymore, but yeah. you know, to, to get through the day is what is what people are utilizing it for now to yep. so just get to the next task. Yeah. Um, so you discovered your entrepreneurial drive was actually wired into your DNA, uh, which is crazy. Uh, so I work with a lot of founders who are trying to find alignment or optimize their workflow but get stuck in cycles of burnout. So do you think some of that could be explained or even avoided by understanding how we're wired for work or rest? Literally yesterday on the way here, I was working with a founder who's sort of like a VIP one-on-one -on -one client who's working on, funny enough, nerves, not nervous system, but literally they have an injury, right? 
So you have an injury, they went to the most expensive surgeon, they paid $120,000 for the surgery, and they're still in pain, right? So I said, step one, okay, you, you're dealing with the hardware issue, but you haven't shifted your approach, which is you are wired for burnout, right? And so what I showed them is their dopamine levels, there's genes around dopamine receptors, and to what intensity level do you feel satisfaction? And some, for some people, including myself, those genes don't work so well. So it's harder to feel the sense of reward or pleasure. Then there's genes around clearance or removal of dopamine, because eventually you come back to your baseline behavior. So if dopamine powers my ability to feel satisfied, and if I have the lowest ability to feel the intensity and the fastest removal, how do I feel satisfied? I am wired for that once in a while reward-seeking behavior, the risk taker. But in, where, where if you throw stimulus at me all day long and I'm seeking it at that level of intensity, I will burn out. And I won't even perceive the burnout because my brain is wired to move at that pace but my body can't keep up, mm -hmm. right? So this was this person and her nerves, the actual physical damage, even the surgery, this $120,000 surgery didn't help because she never stopped. She never took a breath, she never rested. Mm -hmm. And there was this epiphany for her yesterday and she broke down like, I caused this to myself, mm -hmm. right? So yes, in a big way, especially with founders, the exact same wiring that makes you that fantastic entrepreneur is also what's gonna fry your nervous system. You need to understand the tool and use it when needed and turn it off when not needed. So I work with a lot of people uh, with understanding their astrology and their human design. Um, and even when you were talking just now, I'm like, I wonder if he's a fire sign, <laughs> you know? So I gotta ask when your birthday is. So it's September 17th. Okay, oh, well that also tracks Virgo yeah, things. Yeah. Like I always think of Vir like Virgos are always doing, yeah. you know? They, they often experience burnout. Yeah. And they have a lot of uh, gut health issues, which yeah. those go hand in hand. Yes, for sure. Yeah, so yeah. was that your, um, experience with yeah I, I was burnt more. out right and I didn't know and I was I had like 12 different companies and that wasn't enough you know and none of them were really doing well they're all doing good enough mm -hmm. and then so funny you said that two big epiphanies burnout and my gut mm -hmm. right and when I look at the genetics of my gut there's a detox pathway called GSTM1 which is responsible for glutathione activity in the gut. So this master detox antioxidant tool, I don't have the gene, it's missing. Mm. So the exact same foods that I was eating with my business partner where he was okay, I was sick. High inflammation, leaky gut, dysbiosis, leaky brain, exaggerating my burnout, right? So, and then my habits, because of my dopamine profile and my serotonin profile, the irritability and the propensity towards like every little thing matters, right? So mm -hmm. this, this high functioning anxiety drive that now I've learned is the exact tool I need to build and plan and drive the company forward, but 90% of the day it's off, mm. right? When it used to be the opposite. Gotcha, yeah, yeah. That's, it's good to be able to like experience it, embrace it, and then like turn the switch off or on yeah. to know how you need to keep moving forward with that kind of work. So your background spans business, luxury retail, tech, and wellness have a lot of those similar <laughs> things. Uh, so I'm always curious how someone integrates intuition with strategy, and do you think genomics could be a tool for leaders to make more soul-aligned business decisions? So for me, when I discovered my unique DNA, it opened my eyes to the sort of miracle of the human body. And when I got into communities like this and started seeing the technology, that more opened my eyes to the, the miracle of biology. And by working on your health and wellness, that in itself elevates your spirit and your consciousness. That, that itself drives you towards, this thing is incredible that I walk around in every day and I never understood it, mm -hmm. right? So that was the eye-opening thing for me. So I think they kind of go hand in hand, spirit and health, because once you take control and you know how to use the tool, uh, you can't help but be in awe of like what's going on in, in here. Right? right. It's so, inf it's complex, but it's so simple. It's broken, but it's so perfect, you know? And we break it. And, and, and the walking the line between, I'm in ultimate health, but I'm sick, it's just a fine line, it you is. know? <laughs> it is. So, so knowing all that and the perfection we're built in, it just opens your eyes and drives you towards exactly what you're saying. Yeah, the reference you made just now, I think it's similar when I say, you know, there's a very fine line between delusion and faith. Yeah. It's that, it's that same like, Yeah teeter-totter. Um, uh, so when you were talking about health and wellness just now, I was even thinking like outside of 
gene discovery? You know, what does self-care look like for you on a day-to-day? -day? So it's changed a lot, mm -hmm. right? It used to be very regimented, here's what my DNA says and here's what I do and I only eat like this and I take this pile of supplements every day and I exercise like this, right? So very clear, again, high functioning anxiety drive, doing it the way it's supposed to be done and overdoing it and burning myself out on the recovery, right? Mm -hmm. To now knowing that health and wellness tools are kind of built, or not the tools, but the stories you hear and the people you listen to, it's either someone who's an ultimate high level biohacker who doesn't, who you're where, not where you're at, mm -hmm. right? Or it's someone who is at the starting point and it's probably also not where you're at, meaning that they're, they're truly struggling, right? And that's where the majority of our answers come from, but most of us are somewhere in the middle, right? Uh, and when you're somewhere in the middle, the extremes don't work, and this is, you're also not trying to fix and band-aid a fire, right? right? So that's what I had to learn, is that, um, you know, the, the amount of protein I was eating was unnecessary. The amount of supplements I was taking, I'm not a bodybuilder, right? But I'm also not a senior who's trying to maintain, I'm in the middle. Right. right. So all of what I did is now been distilled down to I know all the tools and I use them when I need them. Right. So I eat clean. I move. I relationships is a big one. And now when I need support, I went to the gym. What I take today is gonna be different than what I took yesterday. Right. You know what did I eat? Did I fast? What I take today is gonna be different than what I took yesterday. And I think everybody gets there. And once you're once you're healthy, your body will tell you and you'll hear it. Right. If you're dealing with stress, trauma, you know, uh, inflammation, autoimmunity, you can't hear the signals. And so you gotta deal with all that first. Yeah. Right? And I think part of the not being able to hear it is because uh, so many people are conditioned to keep moving yeah. and keep going. So it's almost like it's designed that way on purpose for them not to pay attention to it. And that's how this culture has made, made lots of money yeah. <laughs> with, with the things. Um, so as a content creator, I'm always seeking ways to make complex wellness tools more accessible and simplify the phrasing around it or understanding of it as well. Uh, what have you found the most challenging and most rewarding about translating deep genomic science into language people can act on and understand? So funny because when we were in our research phase before the company was live, I was in Toronto and research phase, meaning we were working with we're clinically facing with patients, and it was the technology was expensive at the time, so it was people who could afford it. And there was a chief operating officer of one of Canada's largest companies, like 40,000 employees type of company, right? Excuse me, a lot more And in that, he said to me, his son is autistic, wife has serious issues with inflammation, and which led to, we can pinpoint where the autism came from, right? So he said, this is incredible. This is gonna change the world. One thing I have to tell you, you have to make it easy, right? And that's when I understood that even me as a layman trying to learn from our PhDs and doctors or whatever, it was so overwhelmingly complicated. And this is where the, the conduit to the truth comes from like ivory tower and white coats. It doesn't have to. It's like, tell me what's wrong and how to fix it. That's it, Yeah. right? That's it. And it should be that simple. If the tool isn't that simple, it wasn't designed for you. It was de designed for a PhD. And when you have a PhD design a tool, they design it for another PhD. So now you have a room full of people like this with all of the biohacking tools that are designing for themselves, right? And that's why not only do you have great tools, but you understand it, right? Yeah. You get it. And when they speak, it all makes sense. So yeah, that's in a big way part of what's gonna make this stuff more accessible is just the ease of use and understanding and how to self-administer versus I need somebody which you don't really need. Chicago, you've been great, but we can't wait to see Miami in November. Get ready to biohack your best life, baby.